I competed in the 2022 Pokemon Video Game World Championships, the biggest, most important event for competitive Pokemon players around the world. From the trading card game to the video games, players, like myself, spend the entire year training and competing in a number of smaller tournaments to qualify for Worlds. You probably don't know because I never talk about it, but I happen to be the winner of the 2016 World Championship for the mainline video game. This is my journey to reclaim the title I won those years ago. A journey full of heartache, discovery, highs, lows. 2022 threw everything at me, and it all started with the return of in-person events. Because of all the tournaments that were cancelled during the pandemic, this was going to be our first and only World Championship played in Sword and Shield, coming three years after their release. That's right, there hadn't been a World Championship since 2019, and that was played in Ultra Sun and Moon. Now, I've been playing Pokemon competitively in tournaments since 2011, so this was going to be my 10th Worlds. For the entirety of my career, I had entered tournaments at every level with a singular goal in mind, to win. Now, have I achieved this goal? Not even close, but it's never a bad place to aim for. This year, I decided I would take a more pragmatic approach and spend the whole season focusing on the big picture, winning the World Championships. This might seem like a silly distinction, but in reality, this was a huge shift for me mentally. I wanted to win the World Championships and only the World Championships. Instead of trying to win the smaller events along the way, I'd instead use them as training opportunities to attain complete mastery of the final Sword and Shield format. I wanted to fully understand what fundamental skills made up the success or failure of a player and to implement these skills into my own play. This is easier said than done. Competitive Pokemon is unlike most games in that the rules are always changing. Every few months, a new series begins, each with its own set of rules. The basic mechanics stay the same, but some pretty big variables can change and force you to approach the game differently. Even bigger changes come when a new video game and generation come out and a new mechanic is introduced. With something like Sword and Shield's Dynamax, you essentially had to relearn the game. However, this was also unlike any format we'd ever had in competitive Pokemon before. This was our first restricted format, one that includes super powerful, normally banned legendary Pokemon. These formats are unlike any other because the Pokemon allowed are just so strong. It would also be our first time competing in person in two years, the first restricted format with Dynamax, and the first time we'd be seeing overpowered restricted Pokemon, Calyrex and Zacian. If I wanted to win Worlds, I had a lot of learning to do. Our first regional tournament is held in Salt Lake City. I decide to build a team around the Trick Room strategy, which reverses the turn order, allowing for the Pokemon with the slowest speed stat to move first instead. That is, if you can set up Trick Room without being knocked out first. By dedicating an entire team to this strategy, you can invest stat points you'd normally use on your speed stat to make your Pokemon much bulkier. The downside of this, of course, is that if Trick Room is not set up, the game becomes near unwinnable. I start my team off with Palkia and Calyrex Ice. Palkia has phenomenal defensive typing and great natural bulk, making it a reliable Trick Room setter for Calyrex. Calyrex Ice has an abysmal speed stat, but excels in literally everything else. Attack, defense, ability, moveset, this horse can easily run away with the game if you set it up properly. To guarantee Trick Room goes up, I fill the rest of the team with support Pokemon. Ndidi and Amoongus to redirect moves, Dusclops as an alternative Trick Room setter, and... Faramosa? If you've watched any Pokemon this season, you probably noticed that there was a distinct lack of Faramosa. In fact, to my knowledge, I'm the only player who actually brought it to a tournament but I'm not afraid of using a Pokemon just because it isn't popular. Faramosa is faster than both Zacian and Calyrex Shadow and can do huge damage to each of them. I needed something in case I couldn't get up Trick Room. On top of that, it gets a fun little move called Speed Swap, which switches the speed stat of the user and the target. Thanks to Speed Swap, the rest of my team can also attack before Zacian and Calyrex Shadow, giving me a strong option in case I couldn't get Trick Room up in time. Funnily enough, I first realized Faramosa could be good when I got to number one in the world with Pokemon Markiplier would smash. The Salt Lake City tournament arrives and I am killing it. Five best of threes in and I hadn't lost a single game. That's 10 games back to back. I have three opponents left and though I probably just need to beat one of them to advance, 
defeating two guarantees it. And I choke. I finished the day with five wins and three losses. Losing three times in a row after building up all that momentum absolutely crushes me. I fly back home feeling like a shell of who I once was, full of disappointment and regret. For five hours, trapped in a stiff chair at 30,000 feet in the air, all I can do is reflect on where it all fell apart. When you're on a winning streak, you feel on top of the world. Your brain forgets the feeling of losing, and you start asking yourself, could I win this whole thing without a single loss? But part of you knows you can't sustain the streak forever. You try to put it out of your mind. Just focus on the game in front of you, wolf. A losing streak is the exact opposite. You feel at your lowest. You remember the feeling of winning, but... It feels alien somehow, like a story you read as a child, but you can't remember the details of. You know that it's possible for you to win, but the dice just won't land in your favor. And even then, one win isn't enough to make up for all the losses. It's hard to break out. After all these years, I've gotten better at remaining centered in my mind, but ending a tournament on a three-set loss streak after setting up for success with five wins devastated me. I look at the bright side. There's still a handful of tournaments ahead of me. I wasn't gonna win them all, but I could use what I learned from them to win worlds. That was the one goal I set for myself, after all. So I wipe away my metaphorical tears, which I assure you were not real, and take a look back at what I got right and what I got wrong. Hey everyone, I just wanted to jump in and say that this video is probably the most ambitious one on my channel. I actually wrote the script for this September 6th, I think. So it's been in production for quite a long time. I went through, I had five different people edit the script. Um, we had three different parties all work on editing it. We had, uh, it was, it was a lot of work basically. And so, um, I would like to ask you to subscribe if you're enjoying it. Videos like this that are a ton of investment feel kind of bad when, uh, they don't do super well. So anything that you can do to help this video perform well and make it worth all the effort we put into it would be much appreciated. So liking, commenting, and of course subscribing. I hope it's clear how hard we worked on this. Uh, so I hope you feel like it is worth your interaction. Anyway, thank you again for watching, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. First, Dynamax. If you look at my team, you'll notice I really only have two Pokemon that should be Dynamaxing, Calyrex and Palkia. The problem was that I needed to set Trick Room up at the start of each game, but Palkia always ended up taking way too much damage from spread moves, which my redirection was helpless against. I didn't want to Dynamax Palkia if it was already low on HP, so in reality, Calyrex was kind of my only option. Also, my team always struggled to take down other Calyrex and Kyogre, who happened to be paired up on two of the teams I lost against. The third loss was to a Solgaleo team, which neither of my legendaries could get rid of quick enough. In other words, I only had two Dynamax Pokemon, and neither could do damage to several of the most common Pokemon. The other main takeaway was about the format itself. When I won the World Championships in 2016, there were really only three pairings that were considered viable, with one being clearly above the rest. However, at this Salt Lake City Regional, I played against six different restricted pairings over my eight rounds. As I suspected, this format would be very decentralized. In a format where everything is viable, you can't rely on your team alone to carry you. What's most important is your experience with your team and your familiarity with your matchups. But if this did turn out to be a format that could be solved with a single team, similar to 2016, I don't want to waste my time with something else. I know I have to master a team before Worlds, but it's still too early to commit to one. I needed more data. I got another chance to test out a new team at the European International Championships. Unlike Salt Lake City, which was just a regional, EUIC is an international tournament, which meant more competition, more prizes, and more Pokemon. One of my team's many weaknesses in Salt Lake was that I could never step on the gas. Because Trick Room required setting up at the start of each game, I could never come out of the gate swinging, even if I wanted to. This time, I plan to overwhelm my opponent with offense. I decide to build a team around the three fastest, strongest Pokemon in the format, Regieleki, Zacian, and Calyrex Shadow. This team has one goal, to counter the three most powerful duos in the format, Kyogre and Zacian, Groudon and Zacian, and Calyrex Shadow and Zacian. Notice anything similar between these teams? To deal with these powerful duos, I added specific tools like Imprison Calyrex and Fast Miracle Seed Wood Hammer Rillaboom, and then round out the team with Whimsicott for speed control and Incineroar, well, because he's just the best Pokemon in the format, I'm sorry. Now, at this point in the video, I know what you're thinking. Wow, Wolf, 
You're so good at Pokemon. Also, your name is so cool. I wish my name were as cool as yours. Well, I have good news for you. Your name can't be as cool as mine, but it can be a bit cooler thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Established Titles. Established Titles plants a tree with every order and works with global charities One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to support global reforestation efforts. This is a fun novelty, and you can include your title of Lord or Lady on your credit card, plane ticket, or dating profile. Title packs give you at least one square foot of dedicated land on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland, and an official certificate with a crest. The first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will, effectively, be next to my plot within a few minutes of walking distance. Depending on how many of you want to become a lord or a lady, we can build our little Wolfie VGC kingdom. I think it's a really funny concept, and I love that it also goes towards a good cause. Plus, it makes an amazing last minute gift. Established Titles is actually running a massive Black Friday sale right now. Plus, if you use the code Wolfie10, you get an additional 10% off. Go to establishedtitles.com slash Wolfie10 to get your gifts now and help support the channel. The tournament is about to start, and I'm feeling a great deal of confidence. I know that as long as I play against the teams that have been most popular in testing, this was going to be a piece of cake. Spoiler alert, it was not. Things went off the rails pretty quickly. Six of my nine matchups were against teams I hadn't prepared for at all. Despite this, I win seven rounds and advance to day two, where I win three of my five rounds, earning me a respectable top 16 finish. To be honest, I think if you play this tournament a hundred times, I rarely place higher than top 16 and probably do worse more often than not. All in all, I'm quite happy with this performance. I have more knowledge for worlds and I've placed well enough to boot. The vast array of teams at EUIC tells me that this format is, in fact, experience based. One team is not going to solve this meta. Europe on the whole is a competitively stronger region than the US, and an international tournament is a much bigger event than a regional. If someone were to find the answer to this meta, it would have been here. This obviously wasn't the case, as once again, I played against a wide variety of restricted Pokemon. With this understanding under my belt, I knew my next team needs to be built around Pokemon who are inherently strong against everything, rather than just the format's top teams. I need to strike the perfect balance between offense and defense without having to worry about specific matchups. And most of all, I need experience with that team. Experience that would take time. Time that I was running out of. I once again had a lot of trouble with my Dynamax Pokemon at this tournament. Although Rillaboom and Calyrex could Dynamax in a pinch, the truth of the matter was that most of the time, the only Pokemon I was happy to Dynamax was Regieleki. As a side note, this tournament was where I fell in love with my specific Regieleki. At the time, most Regieleki held the Focus Sash or Magnet item, and were used as a support Pokemon that also had the ability to do damage. My Regieleki was modest, held a Life Orb, and used the new move Rising Voltage, which was stronger than most other electric moves in Dynamax. With this specific combination, Regieleki was able to KO bulky Pokemon like Incineroar and Zacian while Dynamaxed, even before Electric Terrain was set up. With Electric Terrain up, my Regieleki could KO Thunderous and Zapdos when they were Dynamaxed, which is just absurd. My takeaway from this team was that overall, it was pretty bad, but Regieleki was so good that it carried me to a very respectable finish. Sorry, I got carried away talking about Reginald. The last thing I learned from this tournament was that I, once again, unwittingly built a team with a single viable Dynamax option. This was partly due to the inclusion of Zacian, who is one of the two restricted Pokemon that can't Dynamax. The reason being, it's already so strong. Look at these stats. Not being able to Dynamax one of your strongest Pokemon really limits your options, especially when you bring two support Pokemon to back it up, leaving you with only one choice, Dynamax Whimsicott, which yes, I actually did use to win a game. I only have two tournaments left. My next stop was in Secaucus, New Jersey for another regional. I needed to make this count. This time, I build my team around Lunala and Groudon, another new pair of restricted Pokemon. Lunadon had had some success in Europe, but the players there were pairing it with Venusaur. I'm sorry to all those Venusaur fans out there, but I have no respect for it competitively and will avoid using it on all serious teams. 
Instead of using a Venusaur, I made my Lunala max speed and modest. Then, with a single speed boost, I'd be faster than Calyrex Shadow, the second fastest Pokemon in the game, behind my dearly beloved Reginald, of course. This was highly unusual for Lunala at the time. Lunala always carried Trick Room, so conventional wisdom was you wanted to train your defenses rather than your speed. I've never been conventional, and I believed in this speedy moon. To aid Lunala, I add a very unusual, high-speed, Rock Tomb White Herb Groudon with Swords Dance. Most Groudon at the time ran the Assault Vest item and focused on their bulk, but this Groudon could slow opponents down with Rock Tomb or, if it got a Swords Dance up, sweep through an entire team on its own. I add Regieleki next because I love him. I also switch out Hyper Beam for Bounce. I needed some way to break Calyrex's Focus Sash while also providing a speed boost to get that KO with Lunala in the same turn. In addition to boosting Lunala's speed, Regieleki could just lower everyone else's with its Electroweb. You see what I'm getting at? Electroweb Calyrex, break its Focus Sash, lower its speed, and then take the KO with Lunala. But what about Tailwind? There's no way you're outspeeding Calyrex then, right? No, you're right. So I suited it up with an Assault Vest just in case. Next up is Charizard. Charizard is one of the single best Dynamax Pokemon in the format, even considering restricted Pokemon. Thanks to its ability Solar Power, it can put out absurd amounts of damage. Holding a Life Orb, Charizard can KO Incineroar with a single G-Max Wildfire. G-Max Wildfire then inflicts passive damage on one-sixth of both opponents' health for four turns. This is unquestionably the best G-Max move in the game. Charizard also has access to a very powerful Max Airstream, the best regular Max move in the game. Lastly, I gave my Charizard a Charty Berry to help it survive any rock moves thrown at it. With only two slots left, I know one of them has to be Incineroar, but who the other would be, I'm at a loss. In the end, I decide on Gastrodon, as without it, I don't have a chance against Kyogre. Earlier, I mentioned not wanting to worry about specific matchups. Ah, uh, forget I said that. If Kyogre's in the format, you need to worry. It's day one of Secaucus, and for what seems like the first time this season, a majority of my matchups have been in my favor. I even beat the one team I was sure I'd lose against. With seven wins and only one loss, I advance to day two. In top eight, I play a really unusual set where I only win because my opponent ran out of time in the first game. In top four, I get one of my best matchups of the weekend. Right as I begin to see my path to take home first place, the rug gets pulled from beneath my legs. My opponent outplays me, like by a lot. And that's it. I'm eliminated again. Sakakas was for testing. My goal is worlds. Top four is not bad at all. I had put my theories into practice and the results were catching up. My team was strong against most Pokemon. And despite playing a lot of unusual teams, I'd had the advantage against the majority of them. I finally reached a good point with Dynamax as well. With four good options, I was guaranteed to bring at least two Pokemon that I could turn big to every game. It wasn't all sunshine and rainbows though. Groudon and Lunala are both inherently inconsistent, with each one having a low accuracy move as their strongest attack. After round 3, I had missed 2 out of 3 Meteor Beams and 6 out of 8 Precipice Blades. Dynamax could have mitigated this somewhat, but I consistently found myself in situations where I had to connect my moves to win, which was ultimately out of my control. Then again, I did perform rather well for having missed this many moves. Had they landed, my matches could have been a cakewalk, skewing my data and making me complacent. Either way, I only have one tournament left to get any more information I need for Worlds. After that, I'm on my own. I am now at a crossroads. I could either try and build something new, as I had for every other tournament this season, or I could get more practice with the Lunala Groudon team I'd used at Secaucus. I'm not as confident in this team as I should be, but I know experience is crucial to this format. I trust my gut, and I go with Lunadon, but with some minor adjustments. I start by switching Assault Vest Regieleki for the Life Orb set. Although it weakens my defense, the ability to overwhelm opponents or catch them off guard when they lead poorly means I can get some easy wins. Incineroar, Groudon, and Charizard all stay the same, aside from slight EV spread changes with help from my friend Jake. Unfortunately, Gastrodon has to go. I'm having a lot of trouble with the Yveltal, Venusaur, and certain Calyrex teams, and Gastrodon isn't helping at all. I drop Gastrodon for Grimmsnarl. This gives me speed support against Calyrex, Venusaur, and those pesky electric types that keep taking out my Charizard before it can even get a move off. It also gets access to Reflect. 
I give Grimmsnarl an Iron Ball to immediately slow down threatening Pokemon with Prankster Trick, as well as Scary Face to control the speed even after. With Grimmsnarl, the team feels incredible. I get a glimmer of the confidence I need to pilot this team comfortably. But there's still one thing I need to know. How do they match up against Kyogre? Well, it turns out that without Gastrodon, I don't have a single water-resistant Pokemon on my team. If I ever end up in the rain, I have no tools to stop Kyogre from obliterating me with its stab attacks. This is a serious design flaw, and I'm embarrassed I let it slip past me. How do I fix this? Lunala outspeeds most things with Regieleki beside it. Do I really need Trick Room? No, let's give it Wide Guard. This allows me to block all spread moves, aka Kyogre's strongest water attacks. Of course, all the opponent needs to do is Dynamax their Kyogre and those spread moves become single target attacks. Little did they know, that's exactly what I want them to do. Ha 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 ha. Not really, no, that would be bad. This was just something I was going to have to deal with. With Wide Guard, I can reposition a bit easier in the rain. It's not a perfect solution by any means, but it is the best I can come up with with what little time I have left. I also have the World Champ difference and can simply outplay Kyogre if I ever run into it. Oh no, I feel a temptation. Something luring me from my path. Calyrex Ice and Reggie Alecki. The Pokemon Regieleki hates more than anything are ground and grass types. It also hates being outsped. Calyrex Ice destroys ground and grass types and threatens Trick Room for any teams with Tailwind or Max Airstream options. Playing a few games on the ladder couldn't hurt, right? I throw together a quick team made up of Calyrex Ice, Alecky, Incineroar, Porygon 2, and Rillaboom, and begin my ascent or descent, if you think about it in terms of my sanity. Here I am, 2 a.m. on a Tuesday, destroying teams left and right. I don't even have a second restricted Pokemon. Finally, the dust settles. I now have another fork in the road. Stick with Lunadon or switch to this new, potentially stronger team. My head is screaming at me to switch, but everything in my gut is telling me not to. I go with my gut. I just can't risk it this late in the season. I keep Lunadon and put this new team in my back pocket in case things go south at NAIC. With the blink of an eye, it's here. The last tournament before Worlds. I spend the day leading up to it manifesting not playing any Kyogre. It turns out that either manifesting is not real, or I accidentally manifested lots of Kyogre, because about half of my opponents had one on their team. Just like EUIC, I managed to go 7 wins and 2 losses, but this time my wins are a lot cleaner. Turns out, actually landing my moves does make things easier. One of those losses was to a team made up of Calyrex Ice, Grimmsnarl, Kyogre, and Max Speed Urshifu Dark, which was a nightmare of a matchup. None of my Pokemon felt good going up against that. The other loss was against a team I thought I had the advantage over, but just like my last match at Secaucus, my opponent outplayed me at every turn. Nevertheless, most of my wins were 2-0, which is very ideal for a tournament setting. As a funny aside, I battled a player who ended up getting second at the World Championships, and won pretty convincingly. The team he used to get second is my exact same 6 Pokemon, and almost all the same sets as I beat him with. To me, this shows clearly that the team was doing something right. Anyway, I advance to the second day and feel pretty good about my chances. I lose the first round, in a matchup where I had a huge advantage. I then get the bye the second round, lose the third round to a Kyogre of course, play my friend Marcus the fourth round, he forfeits, and then I go on to win the fifth round against a Kyogre Shedinja team. I end day two with one win and two losses. A pretty pathetic performance for such a good team. I now have all the information I need to win Worlds, but this team is beginning to show its cracks. Every match I play, I see another imperfection I could solve with you know who. Now let's talk about some people you don't know, my friends who helped me build these teams. I can say confidently that the only reason I've had nearly as much success as I've had in Pokemon is because I am surrounded by brilliant, talented people. Because we've been doing this whole competitive Pokemon thing for a while, we had a pretty good rhythm going into Worlds. Here's the team and the roles everyone filled. 
Aaron Trailer, my main team building partner since 2018 and my friend since 2011. He's brilliant, one of the hardest workers I know, and is always improving himself and his play. Aaron was my main go-to for building this team. We messaged tirelessly back and forth, and he always kept me on track when I started to go off the rails. Marcus Stadter, one of my best friends and another team building partner. I could not have won the world championships in 2016 without Marcus, and though he stepped back from the game the last few years, he was back in full force in 2022. I think if a scientist was trying to construct the perfect human, they'd have a hard time making someone better than Marcus. He's unbelievably smart, one of the funniest people I know, kind and hardworking. Whenever I lost my footing, I reached out to Marcus to ground me and get me back on track. Justin Karras, another one of my best friends. Justin is someone I know I could call at any time of the day and he'd be there for me no matter what he had going on. For Worlds, I wanted to prioritize the matchup against Tornadus Kyogre and Zacian, otherwise known as Tornogre. I called on Justin to help me practice, and we played maybe a hundred games of just that matchup. At Worlds, I went on to beat every single Tornogre I played. Justin also served as our guy in the chair for this tournament, providing support from back home, even waking up super early to make sure he was available despite the five hour time difference. Aaron Zhang, the specialist. Although Aaron has been prioritizing commentary over competing the last few years, he's still one of the best players in North America. Aaron was invaluable to this process because of his ability to pick up any team and play it at the top level. Aaron threw every weird matchup under the sun at me and provided vital experience against teams we wouldn't see anywhere else. He then took the time to go through and document every team he thought we should be aware of going into the tournament. I cannot stress enough how important this was. As a side note, there was one matchup that I thought I might never be able to beat. In testing, I went like one win, 20 losses against him, and Aaron had never even used this team before. I ended up playing this exact matchup at Worlds, and won without dropping a game. They weren't even close. That's the Aaron Zhang difference, baby. Lastly, Leonard Kraft. Leonard has been a good friend of mine since 2015, and his understanding of the mechanics of the game are unmatched. He also does immense amounts of good for the community as a whole, advocating for competitive Pokemon on Showdown, researching mechanics, and recording matches at the World Championships to preserve the game's history. I reached out to Leonard to help me with my EV spreads, which I consider myself to be pretty good at already, but when it comes to EVs, in my opinion, Leonard is better than anyone else. He brought out my team's full potential and gave me faith in them, something I sorely needed if I wasn't going to have the season's worth of experience I had hoped for. Now that you know about the human team, let's get back to talking about our monster team. The Kyogre weakness just isn't tenable. I have to drop Lunadon. I know, I know, I've been crying, experience, experience this entire time. But another key factor in success is faith in your team. And I don't have faith that this team can beat Kyogre. But you know who can beat Kyogre? Reginald. It was time to finally take a proper look at the team I built before NAIC. Calyrex, Regieleki, Incineroar, Rillaboom, and Porygon 2. These five Pokemon were winning me nearly all of my practice games, and I didn't even have a second restricted Pokemon. Now, normally, being able to win with only one restricted Pokemon would be a good thing. After all, your team only gets stronger when you add another super strong Pokemon to it, right? Here, it's actually kind of tough. There aren't that many restricted Pokemon. When you have a fully functioning team, it can be kind of difficult to just slot one in and have it fit nicely. I try a bunch of them, and nothing feels right. For like the hundredth time, I'm stuck in team building. I've been using max speed, max special attack Regieleki, but if I drop the speed in favor of bulk, I could Dynamax and survive Kyogre's Mystic Water Rain Boosted Water Spout. I can also switch out Rillaboom for Amoongus, a Pokemon I had experience using earlier in the season. And what if I give it a Focus Sash? I know, I know, it's a little unintuitive because Amoongus is already so naturally bulky, but I need all the bulk I can get. Holy Meltank, the difference is night and day. It feels like Amoongus may as well have been without an item before, and now had the single best item it could ever hold. Being able to survive a move that would normally one-shot is a really big deal, especially when you need to set up Trick Room. Amoongus also adds an extra dimension to the Regieleki mode, keeping it safe by redirecting moves with Rage Powder. The longer Oleki is on the field, the more damage it can put out. Now that I had the rest of the team set to go, I had nothing else to distract me from choosing that second restricted Pokemon. In a moment of weakness, I seek out the Pokemon I swore I'd never use again. No, not Venusaur, gross. Xerneas. 
Xerneas has been pretty terrible this format. Dynamax being a thing hurts it way more than it helps. Trick Grimmsnarl is everywhere, and Zacian eats it for breakfast. I know I need more help against Kyogre in the second restricted slot, and since Xerneas can become so specially bulky, I decide to try it out. I also swap out Porygon 2 for Mimikyu with the Utility Umbrella item, which could allow Mimikyu to survive a water spout. Given that 99% of you probably have no idea how Utility Umbrella works and haven't seen Xerneas all season, this change didn't fully stick. Utility Umbrella was cute, but Mental Herb was far more consistent. In order to stop Mimikyu from setting Trick Room, an opponent had to have a very specific combination of Pokemon. And even then, I had ways around it thanks to Incineroar, Amoongus, and Regieleki. But Xerneas isn't working. I take a step back again. What did my last Pokemon need to accomplish? 1. It needs to be able to seriously damage Kyogre both in and out of Dynamax. 2. It needs to be fast. And 3. It needs to add a different dimension to the team rather than adding more to the Trick Room mode. I have a moment of realization. Like a dog playing fetch, Zacian comes running back, sword in mouth. I had initially dropped Zacian because of its inability to Dynamax, but I'm now realizing it's the only Pokemon that's going to fit here. With Incineroar and Amoongus, I could create enough space to make Substitute Zacian really work. What I failed to account for was enemy Incineroar switching in to get an Intimidate right as I subbed, and then using Parting Shot, leaving my Zacian stuck at minus one. Aaron Trailer suggests using Swords Dance instead. At first, it felt kind of silly. Zacian already gets an attack boost from its ability, but I give it a go. And whoa, Swords Dance is exactly what Zacian needed. And just like that, I have a full team again, one that could win the world championships. Here's a quick rundown of the Pokemon and what they're trained to do. Mimikyu runs Taunt and Will-O-Wisp for Disruption, Shadow Sneak for Focus Sash and Lunala, and is the team's main Trick Room setter. I make it as specially bulky as possible for the best odds of survival in Kyogre, Calyrex, and Lunala. Amoongus is here to support Trick Room going up, spore opponents who are unprepared, and keep Zacian and Regieleki alive outside of Trick Room. It's trained to level Life Orb Charizard G-Max Wildfire in the sun through Protect, plus a turn of Wildfire passive damage. Calyrex is the main sweeper under Trick Room. I max out his attack to KO Zacian and Incineroar, and throw in a bit more special defense than normal to have better odds of surviving Life Orb Kyogre Water Spout. Incineroar does Incineroar things, with a bit more speed than usual to get faster fakeouts outside of Trick Room and slower parting shots inside. I give it Throw Chop to hit Lunala and Calyrex for more damage, and to improve its performance as a Dynamax Pokemon in a pinch by turning into Max Darkness. Zacian does huge damage early game and can clean up late game. It's faster than most other Zacian, so it can win a 1v1, and bulky enough to survive two Astro Barrages from Focus Sash Calyrex. I invest the rest of its EVs in attack, for the best odds of picking up KOs. Regieleki is the main Dynamax attacker outside of Trick Room, and the primary Dynamax Pokemon against Kyogre teams. To achieve the best odds of KOing Zacian and Incineroar, I keep its special attack maxed out, and give it the minimum speed necessary to move before them. This leaves me with just the right amount of special defense EVs to survive Mystic Water Kyogre Water Spout in the rain when Dynamaxed, plus a turn of Life Orb Health Reduction. Have I mentioned I'm really worried about Kyogre? And that's the team! There would be no more team building from this point forward. There would be, however, hundreds of hours of studying. First, analyze the competitors. Watch every single game of the players who had performed well this season. This takes me dozens of hours alone as I force myself to watch the same game multiple times in case I missed anything. I watch these games meticulously, analyzing every single interaction. I summarize what I learn in a document per player, with overarching sections on the strengths, weaknesses, and specific habits. I do this for 10 of the top players, and though it's tedious and time-consuming, I gain key insight into my competitor's play. I often got stuck or burnt out on team building this season. VOD analysis provided a break, while still making progress towards my end goal. On top of analyzing player-specific habits, Aaron Zeng creates a master document with all of the teams we had to look out for going into the tournament. I add every noteworthy team from Japan Nationals as well. I then make my own list of general trends that we need to be aware of. For example, a bulky weakness policy Charizard that was picking up in usage. Or how when Whimsicott was paired with Kyogre and Zacian, it often had Charm, Light Screen, Tailwind, and Moonblast. Aaron Trailer would also be using the team we built for his own run at Worlds. To help each other truly master it, we work on a team preview guide together, discussing the major threats to look out for when selecting Pokemon for each match. I then create a matchup guide, with thoughts on how we should approach selecting and using a team against each specific matchup. 
While I do that, Aaron writes two of his own comprehensive documents, one detailing the general ways in which the team wins games, and the other outlining the different goals of specific combinations of four with the team. Lastly, I spend hours every single day memorizing how much damage my Pokemon would do to my opponents, and how much they would do to me. This is the document I was using to memorize my damage calculations. Halfway through, I switched to flashcards so I could memorize on the go. Does this look like a lot of flashcards? Well, those are just the ones for Mimikyu. Here's about half of them, all laid out. And keep in mind, each of these flashcards is double-sided and has multiple damage calcs on it. If you've made it this far, I just want to say thank you. I wanted to show you all the entirety of my process and how seriously I took it. This is what life is like for competitive Pokemon players. It's not just fun and games. It's practice, studying, traveling, teamwork, and fun and games. Now, let's get to what you came here for. Even before I get to the venue, I can tell something special is happening here. The Pokemon Company went all out, with the best world's decor I've seen in my 10 years attending the event. The convention center is bustling. You can feel your excitement and nerves clashing within you, but the atmosphere makes it easy to forget. For everyone here, this is the happiest place on earth. We watch the opening ceremony, and just like that, we're off to the races. My first opponent is from Japan, which isn't what I'm hoping for in a round one match. Because the structure of the Japanese circuit is very different from other regions, players there tend to use a lot more off-the-wall strategies. The game starts and my heart sinks. Kyogre, Zacian, Incineroar, these I'm prepared for, but when paired with Torkoal, Venusaur, and Porygon 2, I have zero experience here. Venusaur outspeeds both Oleki and Zacian when Torkoal sets up the sun, and because it has a Life Orb boosted Weather Ball, it can KO my Zacian and Calyrex, or even Incineroar by switching in Kyogre and setting up the rain. Regieleki, who is the main Pokemon I use to handle Kyogre, is at a huge disadvantage against Venusaur. I lose game 1, and though I have signs of life in game 2, I make a bunch of mistakes and lose again. I'm at a loss for words. I felt like I was watching someone else play for me, like I wasn't the one making the decisions. Normally, I think 2-4 to four turns ahead when playing Pokemon. In this set, I wasn't even able to think a single turn ahead. I couldn't consider the consequences of any of my moves. I need to turn things around. My round 2 opponent has a Lunala Groudon team that I'd been a bit worried about, but at least I had experience in the matchup. My play wasn't where I'd like it to be, but I managed to win games 1 and 2, putting me at 1 win, 1 loss. The third round is against the team Aaron Zhang used to mop the floor with me in testing. Calyrex Shadow, Kyogre, Regieleki, Mianchao, Whimsicott, and Indeedee. If I lose here, I'd be on my last life already. I knew I had to do everything I could to stay alive. I applied pressure, made hard calls, and, against all odds, won convincingly in two games. I feel good going into lunch. There were five rounds left, and I'd need to win four of them. I put some stew in my stomach and head back to the venue to face my next challenge. Another Japanese player with another unusual team. Zacian and Groudon, paired with Thunderous, Venusaur, Incineroar, and Tapu Fini. The Groudon is White Herb, making it really hard to minimize its damage output. I lose game one. For game two, I bring Regieleki, an unusual choice against Groudon and Venusaur, but it pays off, securing me the win. It was all down to this last game. My opponent brings Venusaur for the first time, the nightmare Life Orb Weather Ball Venusaur that ruined my life in round one. Venusaur overwhelms my team, and I lose the set. Two wins, two losses. I hate you, Venusaur. At this point, my mental game is cracking. I'm very disappointed in myself, less about the loss and more about how far below average I was performing in game. I'm struggling to remain present, and I don't feel good about my decision making at all. Unfortunately, because of how long that set took, there isn't much time to collect myself. I let out a sigh of relief. My next opponent has a team that is arguably my best matchup. I win game 1 convincingly, sweeping with Regieleki. I make a Pokemon adjustment for game 2, but my opponent uses Gastrodon's Yawn to slow down the pace of the game, dragging it out for way too long. I lose sight of the end game, and forget that my opponent still has Calyrex Sensation in the back. I lose game 2. The matchup is still in my favor though. For game 3, I lead with Incineroar and Regieleki, which would match up very favorably against my opponent's Calyrex Sensation lead from the last game, but they lead with Thunderous instead, a Pokemon they hadn't brought one time this entire set. My Incineroar's Intimidate immediately gives Thunderous a Defiant boost, and I fall too far behind to stop Thunderous and Calyrex from running through my team. I lose the game the set, and I'm eliminated from the World Championships. Two wins, 
three losses. It sounds melodramatic, but I don't know how else to put it. My heart was broken. I worked so hard, spent so many months for this moment, and in the end, I had my worst world's performance of all time. What was all of it for? Why did I work so hard when I could have done better with no prep at all? Aaron Trailer is eliminated a few rounds later, and Marcus, our last good friend in the tournament who auto-qualified to day two and brought a different team, finishes four wins, three losses the next day. One win away from advancing to the final stage, but eliminated nonetheless. It feels really bad to give your all to something and not even come close. But that's the nature of competing, regardless of the game. Win or lose, what's important is that you learn something. I wasn't about to let all this hard work go to waste. And I wanted to play more Pokemon. You see, the World Championships hosts another tournament called the Open. It happens on the Saturday of the tournament, when all but the top performing players are eliminated. It even awards points you can use towards the next season's World Championships. I decided to give the team one last shot before retiring it for good. So I entered the London Open. The morning of the Open rolls around and I head over to the venue to get ready to play. I'm still not performing at my level, but I am playing better than I did at World. I have a number of strong opponents, but I'm able to beat almost all of them. One win, two wins, three wins, four wins, five wins in a row. My next opponent is Bingji Wang, a very strong player who always uses unorthodox Pokemon. Of all the things to lose to, it's his Glycopod that gets me. I know I need to win my remaining games in order to advance. Without too much trouble, I make it into top 16. As a fun fact, I played one of the players I had watched the VODs of here, and the habits I noticed during my analysis helped me win the set against them. In top 16, I face off against yet another unusual team I hadn't prepared for. After making an abysmal move in game 3, I end up losing to an untimely double protect. 8 wins, 2 losses in the London Open, earning me some points towards the next season. Respectable, if nothing else. And with that, my time at the World Championships is over. I pack my bags, say goodbye to my friends, and head home reminiscing over the past five months. Pokemon is a brutal game. You can reach the absolute peak, become the best in the world, and still find yourself struggling to keep up. Pokemon looks at you and says, you wanna be the best? It's a hell of a mountain to climb, kid. And once you reach the top, goes, oh yeah, by the way, I got another mountain for ya. The game is always changing. So many players are fighting with everything they've got to reach that peak. For me, Pokemon isn't about reaching the top and staying there undisputed forever. It's about getting knocked down and getting back up, over and over and over. Pokemon will push you to your limit. Competing is about overcoming that limit. I've played Pokemon competitively for over a decade. I've been knocked down more times than I can count. And this year, where my prep was the best it ever was, was without a doubt my worst performance at Worlds. I gave everything I had to become the world champion, and I didn't even come close. And despite it all, I'm getting back up and trying again. Next year and the year after that, again and again and again until I can't play anymore. Because I love this game. Yokohama, I'm Wolf Glick, and I'll see you in 2023.